Okay, so um, this is a, a subclass. So last time we talked about the subclass um, elasmobranchii, which includes what? Um, sharks and rays. Sharks and rays and, and related forms. And so the other subclass of the class chondrichthys is the holocephali, referred to as ratfish or, or chimera. Um, and I just showed that last time. So the, the, the idea here is to kind of contrast the ratfishes with the elasmobranchs. And so one of the things that's different about them, instead of having five to seven gill openings on either side of the head, they all have four. So that's, that's different. Um, it, specifically, you know, the number is different, but also the consistency is different. So all ratfish have four gill openings on either side of the head. Um, they also don't have a spiracle. So the, all the shark, or not all the sharks, but most of the sharks and rays have a spiracle, which is believed to be a remnant opening um, uh, that occurred during the reorganization of the branchial skeleton. So these guys don't have that, um, pretty simple. They also don't have scales. So sharks have placoid scales. These guys, are their skin is naked, so really smooth. They don't have any type of scale um, on the surface of the, of the epidermis. They also don't have a cloaca. Right, so when, and I kind of drew a picture up on the board last time. The cloaca is an is a, a space in the digestive system that receives material from the digestive system and the urogenital system. And so these guys don't have that. They have a, obviously an opening that um, that allows the undigested material to exit. Um, but they also have separate openings for the urogenital material. So nitrogenous waste and gametes are released in, well not the gametes, but the, the urogenital system has a separate opening um, and, and it's uh, not a common chamber as is the cloaca. Um, they are compressed form, so most of the elasmobranchs are what? What's that? Those of you who are here on two steps, what's that? Depressed. depressed, right? So dorsal ventrally depressed are the elasmobranchs, laterally compressed are the holocephali. Um, there's just no picture. Um, the, the other diff one of the other differences is that instead of an amphistylic jaw suspension, which allows the upper jaw to protrude from the margin of the head so it's not connected to the skull, these guys have a holostylic jaw suspension, which means the upper jaw is connected to or part of the skull, okay, so it's like ours, right? So we can't stick our, we can't do anything with our upper jaw. It's fused to the floor of the skull. Lower jaw is free and it can go up and down, but these guys similar to that, as opposed to the elasmobranchs where the upper jaw is not connected to the skull, it moves freely in relationship to the skull. These guys also have um, some poison glands or a poison gland that is at the base of the dorsal spine. And the, of course the, the spine is erectible so they can lift it up if they need to. And of course the main function of that would be a defense mechanism for potential predators. So obviously that's not characteristic of, of sharks. Another difference, generally speaking, of these guys is their habitats. And so mostly they're, they're deep water marine animals, uh, which is, True for, I mean, most, most elasmobranchs are also marine animals, but not necessarily confined to deep water environments. And so these guys are typically uh, much more, or found in much deeper water. So ranging from 80 meters to 2,600 meters, which is quite deep. Um, there are some species that will be found in kind of near shore habitats, but generally speaking, they are deep water animals. Um, and they, and, and some of them are quite large, and so this is a, a particular type of ratfish. And this is one of the more deep water animals, and so they can get kind of big um, in in those environments. Not so much in the near shore environments, but that's just a, a pretty good example of kind of the unusual form that these guys take. They mostly feed on benthic invertebrates, and so and, and we talked about this a little bit. Some of the marine uh, invertebrates are quite large, and so. These, these big animals are predators on some of those larger invertebrates. Um, and if you look at their mouth, they, instead of having teeth, this is kind of hard to tell, instead of having teeth like elasmobranchs, they've got plates um, that, that are more designed for crushing instead of ripping. Um, and that's mostly because they're feeding on invertebrates that typically have a relatively hard exoskeleton. So that allows them just to kind of crush their prey and then they'll, um, it, you know, um, 
the digestive system will digest all the all the soft tissue and then any kind of hard material that can't be digested is eliminated. Okay, so in the same class, different subclass, quite different animals as compared to the elasmothranes. Okay, so the next group that we'll talk about, of, of course, is, um, is in contrast to the chondrichthian fishes, um, and it's made up of several different classes, but they're lumped together in, and, and actually I, I, I probably should change this, but this is, this is more of an older term that kind of lumps the, the non-cartilaginous fishes together into a group. It's, not, it's probably not a real evolutionary, or evolutionary um, trend or group, and so it's somewhat artificial at this point, but, and, and, that's, and that's kind of why we call it braid and not any of the other taxonomic terms. So teleostomy is the name of this group of organisms, basically fishes that aren't chondrichthians. Um, and so some of them are extinct, in, and I'll mention this later, but some of them are probably more closely related to the chondrichthian fishes than they are to the other fishes, and so that's why it's kind of an artificial term and, and more obsolete at this point. But they do share some similarities among, uh, among uh, each other, and so mostly those are kind of uh, cranial features, so it could be position or size of the, the elements that make up the skull. Um, the, the, some of the scales are very similar across these animals, and the fins are more similar to each other than they are to the chondrichthian structure of the fins, and so that's why historically at least they were grouped into, a, into a, um, one single grade. And so we just finished talking about the class chondrichthes. This group of animals includes three separate classes, uh, and so um, and like I said, some of them are, gonna, are, are ultimately probably more closely related to the chondrichthian fishes than they are to the other bony fishes. And that would, this, would be this group, the, the group Acanthodii, or the class Acanthodii. Um, the common name for these guys is the spiny sharks. I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. But this, this whole group is extinct, and so we won't see any representatives of the Acanthodii um, in, in lab or I don't have any specimens of these guys. The whole group is extinct. The other group is the class Sarcopterygii. This is, includes the lobe fin fishes, which also includes the lung fish. So all those animals are kind of lumped together. We'll talk more about those. And then the other class, you're, you're probably not, or you may not be familiar with the name, but Actinopterygii includes what we would describe as the ray fin fishes, which includes most fish. Um, you know, if you, if you said a fish, it's probably in this group unless it's a shark or something like that. So all the fish that you think about when you think of the word fish are in this group. So the most, the most diverse group of all fishes on Earth today would be the class Actinopterygia. Okay, so just kind of go through these guys, these guys and talk a little bit about them, at least the ones that, you know, that uh, we'll, we'll talk mostly about the Actinopterygia because they have the most representatives and, and highest amount of radiation. So this is the oldest known jawed vertebrates, um, and so we can see them in the fossil record about 460 million years ago. And again, um, the, the term spiny sharks comes from their, their kind of overall morphology. They look like sharks, but some of the things about them are different, um, in, including there's more bone in their skeleton, and so that was one of the reasons why we kind of lumped them together with all the more bony fishes. Uh, as opposed to together with the, the chondrichthian fishes, but more modern evidence, I guess, suggests that these guys are more closely related to the chondrichthians than they are to the sarcopterygians or the actinopterygians. Okay, so some of their characteristics include a heterosursal tail. So you guys kind of explored that in lab, um, where the you know the vertebral column and the elements of it come up into the dorsal lobe. Um, their, their, their skeleton is mostly cartilaginous, but there are some places where it becomes ossified, so it's, it, you know, it's a little bit similar to uh, more bony fishes, but it's also similar to the chondrichthian fishes, and so that's one of the reasons why it kind of wiggles back and forth. If you think about the, like over the history of human classification of this group, it's gone back and forth because it's kind of, kind of a mixed of, mix of characteristics that doesn't really fit either group very well. Um, they also have a row of spines in front of the dorsal fin or as part of the dorsal fin, and that's where the spiny comes from. 
they look like they've, they've got like a, a series of spines near the front of the animal. They were hypothesized to be active predators, um, mostly in the water column, and so, um, and their morphology looks a little bit like sharks, and so you can see that the, the dorsal lobe is a little bit longer than the ventral lobe. This is a pretty classic example of a heterosursal tail, so the vertebral column extends all the way up into almost the end of the tail, and then the, the lower end of that is, is mostly thin rays and, and membrane. And then you can see the, the spines that are pretty typical of these guys. And so their mouths are term, terminal, which again suggests they're active predators in the water column, um, probably feeding on some of the other um, fishes that have been evolving, the, the jawless vertebrates, as well as all the invertebrates that were present in marine environments. Okay, so those are the Acanthodii, so obviously I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those guys. Um, the next group is the Sarcophorygium. These are the lobe fin fishes. And so the, the main distinctive features between these guys and the others, um, one of the main things is the, is the structure of the fins. And so I'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about the other group. Uh, but just as a, as a reference, you know, so you have something to think about here. Um, so, when, wow, that doesn't write at all. I specifically picked purple for the tiger's Sad. Okay, so if you, you know, if you think about the fins of a fish, mostly what you have are structures like this, and they're supported by really flexible filamentous elements. And so most of the fins for fishes are, are flexible. Um, and then the other thing that's true about this fin structure is that the, the muscles that move the elements are not in the fin, right? So the, the musculature of the fin is what we call extrinsic. Which means the muscles are not part of the fin itself. Okay, and so if, if we were to look at this more closely, we'd see at the very base of this fin, you have some, some bony elements called radials, and then the muscles that move the elements are in the body wall. And that's what we mean by extrinsic, right? They're not part of the fin. And the elements that support the fin are long, thin, flexible. The sarcopterygian fishes have what we would call lobate fins, okay? So if we look at that, and if you look at the fin, it has the same basic shape, but the internal structure of it is different. And so, and that's what a lobate is, more of a lobe. But if you look inside that, the bones that support that are not long filamentous elements. They are blocks. And there's a bunch of different types of sarcopterygian fishes. Most of them are extinct. But if you look at the internal support of these fins, there's some variation on that. At the very end of that, then you also have these filaments that are more ray thin like. And then the other major element to that is that the musculature of the fin is what we would call intrinsic. Which means what? The muscles are part of the fin. Are, they're in the fin itself. So the, the muscles that move the elements of the fin are in the fin. And so that gives this thing some independent movement, right? So the muscles that, that allow this to move are attaching one bone to another in the fin itself which is what happens in another group of organism, um, and that would be the terrestrial vertebrates, right, the tetrapods. The muscles that move my hand are in my forearm, right? The muscles that move my upper arm or lower arm are in my upper arm. So all the elements that move this are in this itself. And of course, I have some extrinsic ones too that will allow me to move the whole thing, but these guys, obviously are more similar, and depending on which one you're looking at, some of them then begin, you know, over the evolutionary history, you'll have 
more elongated ones like that and then you'll have smaller ones at the end and then you start to see joints in there too which allow them to flex that which is what our feet and, and hands look like um, as terrestrial organisms the tetrapods so this group is more closely related to the amphibians or the tetrapods than they are to other fishes and that's what again goes back to what we said earlier about not having uh, a term taxonomic term that means fish okay the other thing about them is that they have a structure that also kind of unites them with the terrestrial or terrestrial um, vertebrates the tetrapods and that is they have a lung and the lung is formed in a particular way and that is through a ventral which means what Use your words, Brandon. Not your hands. <laughs> what does ventral mean? What does dorsal mean? Bottom. Ventral? Bottom. There you go. Ventral is bottom, right? So the ventral, so the, the lungs are formed in these organisms via their embryological development through a ventral outpocketing or evagination of the digestive system. And so, and that represents, well, here's the, here's the te tetrapod right here, right? And then, and uh, this is a lungfish right here. Okay, so, and, and this happens with us, right? All the, all the tetrapods, including humans and amphibians and reptiles, it all happens the same way. Our digestive system is a tube open from one end to the other, and along the way, stuff happens to it, right? And one of the things that happens to it is we have a ventral outpocketing of it so that when we pull in air, air goes into the lungs and we get oxygen that way. So these guys have exactly the same form of the lung development as the tetrapods do. And again, that unites them with the tetrapods. In contrast to that, you've got the other types of fishes that we'll talk about later that also have this sac that's filled with air, like a lung, but it develops in a different way. It develops dorsally, right? So here's the digestive system, here's the digestive system. And that sac that's filled with air, otherwise known as a gas bladder, develops as a dorsal outpocketing of the digestive system, and it is single, right? So just one sac, this is double again the same as the the tetrapods and that's what links these guys to one of the many things that links these guys to the um the, the tetrapods okay so that those are the two of the key ones and of course their name comes from this morphology of the fins they're lobe like and they're supported by bony elements on the inside they also have internal nares, um, which is very hard to see on this one, at least with the lights on. Um, I'm not sure if I know where they are. I thought I did. Uh, yeah, here's one right here. All right, so internal nares, and so the external nares are out there. Internal nares are internal nares, nares are in the buccal cavity, just like a frog. And that, that allows these organisms to pull air in through the nostril into the buccal cavity and then push it into the lungs. Um, fishes up the other fishes the rapefin fishes that we'll talk about later don't have that they have external layers no internal layers there's no connection between the environment and the buccal cavity through the nostrils it's only for chemosensory capabilities okay and of course you know, the, all this discussion kind of leads to the fact that um, some member right of this group some ancestral member of this group evolved into what we now call the tetrapods and that and the first ones were of course what we would generally classify as amphibians okay and then some of them remained organisms that we still refer to as fish why why do we still call lungfish and lobefish fish they still live in the water because they live in water right and that's the only reason because they live in the water they have gills similar to but really they're more closely related to those animals that we don't call fish and so that's where the, the taxonomic problem with the term fish comes in okay so within this group within the class Sarcopterygii, um, we'll have two orders that i want to talk about um, coelacanthiformes 
common name what? Anybody? Coelacanth. Yep. Um, and so just for taxonomic purposes here, if the name ends in Iformes, it is an order. Okay, so if I ask you uh, which order of fishes includes the coelacanth, you at least know the end of it, which is what? Iformes. Right, so yeah, so I'm just that kind of helps you put it in, you know, in context when you're dealing with taxonomic terms and stuff. So two orders within the class um, Sarcopterygii, those, in, those include Coelacanthiformes and Ceratodontiformes. Um, and so if we look at the Coelacanth, so this is the common name is a Coelacanth. And so um, one of the things I think that, that we forget, including myself, is that these animals were, were diversifying from a common ancestor changing through millions of years of evolution. And so some of the forms that we find don't resemble those fossil forms that we believe are close, you know, close ancestors to the amphibians. They were also changing. And so, and, and you know, a lot of things change in the, in the morphology, behavior, physiology of animals as they evolve independently from others. And so some of them don't really resemble what we would call a tetrapod, but many of their ancestors obviously had much more close morphological resemblances. Um, the coelacanth is kind of one of those things. Some of the features of the coelacanth don't match with what I just told you because they do things differently and they're in different environments and those things that I just told you don't work, right? And so they've, they've changed since their common ancestor. Okay, so these guys were, the, the coelacanthiformes, we knew about, we, you know, biologists have known about this group for a long time. Um, we, we believed that they were extinct. And so we knew the first evidence of them was in sediment that was aged to be about 360 million years old. And then we find them all, you know, all different types of, of coelacanthiformes animals in the fossil record until about 800 million years ago when we think they went extinct. So we don't find any in any sediment younger than 80 million years. And that's why we say, okay, this, this group of organisms lasted from 360 million years ago to 80 million years ago. Um, but uh, a young lady um, by the name of Marjorie Courtney Latimer um, was working in a museum in South Africa. And one of the things that she did was she, she, was, she was building the collection, the, the, the museum specimens, the collections of not just fish, but a variety of things. Um, but one of them included different specimens of, of interesting fish. And so one of the ways that she got specimens for that was she would go down to the fish market um, I just recently, relatively recently, went to Brazil uh, and, and in Manaus, Brazil, went down to the fish market and it was incredible, all the cool stuff that you see in, in a fish market in a place like that. It was huge and there were all kind of cool fish coming into the market and they were just selling them you know, over the market. It was, it was really fascinating. I was really shocked at how much I enjoyed that aspect of our trip to Brazil because most of it was out in the wilderness and stuff and I, I dig that. But the, that part of it was really, I'll never forget that. Um, and that's what um, Marjorie was doing. She was going down to the fish market, looking at things, and she saw this specimen and instantly recognized it as something different. And she suspected it was a, a coelacanthiformes. And, and she knew that because she read a lot. And so she, she, you know, she was a person who understood the evolutionary history of fishes, and she saw this and said, this is something special. Um, and so she, she went through fairly great measures to preserve the thing because this is just you know, an animal that someone caught and now they're selling it at the market. It's not gonna last very long because it's gonna decompose. And so they did all kinds of crazy stuff to keep it preserved because back in those days, you, know, you couldn't just go get a big bat and put a bunch of formula in. And, you know, it, was, it was challenging to do that. So um, they, they did a lot of wild stuff to keep it preserved. And then she sent the specimen to a uh, uh, a professional ichthyologist, J.L.B. Smith, and he confirmed it, of course, to be a coelacanth. And so a member of this group that we thought had been extinct for 80 million years was now showing up in um, fish markets. And it probably had always been showing up in fish markets in South Africa, except now you had someone who knew something about fish, saw it, and recognized it as something special. So that animal was described, um, scientifically described, given a scientific name, um, the, the genus is Latimeria, and of course that is from where? 
last name, her last name, um, Courtney Latim, uh, Latimer. So he, you know, kind of recognized her as, as being the person who recognized it as something special and, and started the process in describing that thing. Um, Chalumne is the specific epithet, and that comes from a river in South Africa where the animal was found um, uh, and, uh, and in, that, in that general vicinity is where they found the coelacanth. And then this is a, a, a photograph of a live coelacanth mucking around in some rocky uh, outcrops in relatively deep water. Um, in 1999, there was a new species described from another location uh, in Ind Indonesia, and that one is called Latimeria mandoensis. And so uh, there's, there's two known species of this animal. Uh, and there's been, a, it, I read a book, I can't remember the name of the book, but the book I read was, was about kind of the, the, the discovery of that and then the subsequent um, search for others. And there was a lot of museums in, around the world that were kind of battling to get specimens of this thing because it was so unique. Um, and, and that led to some pretty wild stories and, and kind of competition among people that were out looking for stuff. Okay, so that's the that's the coelacanthiformi. So um, there's only two species of this animal known to be that they exist on Earth, and, and that's their their story. Okay, um, so some of the their features, um, as I said, they've got fleshy lobate fins, and so this is this is just a picture of this um, the, this animal's fin. So this part of the fin is where you've got the really robust bony elements in it. And then of course it also has the filamentous rays like other fishes do, but, it, but other fishes don't have this part of it. So these guys also have lobate fins and they've pretty much used that to kind of slowly move around on the bottom. They're mostly benthic animals or they live on rocky, you know, submerged rocky environments in the, in the geographic locations where they occur. The, um, the lung for these guys is described as vestigial which is what? Roughly what does vestigial mean? Just on the bottom. Reduced part that doesn't have the same function as it did in its ancestors. Yeah, what did you say? Not that? No. no. That, okay, so, yeah, so reduced, um, and generally the function is not the same as its uh, predecessors, and so the lung, which is a, an outpocketing, the, the ventral outpocketing of the digestive system, they have it, but it's vestigial. Um, and the reason why it's vestigial is because they live in deep water environments, you know, um, 80 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters deep. There's no reason for them to have a lung, right? So over the course of their evolutionary history, that has been reduced. It takes a lot of energy to produce these complicated organs. And if you have no use for it, you're better off not having it. So, you know, natural selection has produced a form that doesn't have that. Um, the, this vestigial outpocketing is filled with fat, which does what, do you think? Store energy. Uh, it could store energy, uh, so, and that's probably true a little bit. What else would a fat-filled lung help them do? Um, maintain heat. Say again? Maintain heat. Um, not so much maintain heat. So these animals are, they're, they're ectothermic animals, and so their body temperatures are, are generally pretty similar to what the environmental temperature is. So cool water environments, but we you gonna say that? Same thing that, sh I, I said sharks have really fatty livers. What's that? Float. Yeah, it helps them maintain their buoyancy. So they, do, they don't have a gas bladder. Why don't they have a gas bladder? Don't need it. Um, well, they don't need it, but why would you automatically say a coelacanth or a, or a lungfish doesn't have a gas bladder? I might have been a little too subtle about this earlier, so you might not be able to pick it up, but think about it for a minute. They're lungfish, so there's two main groups of fishes. The lungfish that have lungs, and then everybody else, the rapin fishes that have gas bladders. Right, so those two things aren't the same. Uh, there are no fish that have lungs and gas bladders. All right, so that represents kind of a great division among the fishes. There's two main groups, Actinopterygii, Sarcopterygii. Sarcopterygians have lungs. Actinopterygians have a gas bladder. So these guys don't have a gas bladder, so they can't use that. Um, they have lungs, or their ancestors had lungs, but they've been modified to be reduced and filled with fat, which helps them with
with their buoyancy control living in deep water environments. Um, and there, there you go, their, their habitat is deep water. This is another living specimen. Um, so 100 meters below the surface, and that was one. Of, and so one of the one of the things that kind of one of the, the the dramatic scenes that developed around this animal is trying to keep one alive, because everybody, all the museums wanted to have a live coelacanth because it was so incredible, you know, such an incredible discovery. So, but the problem was this: they they live in really deep, cold water, and it was really difficult to try to figure out how these guys could survive at the surface, because as soon as you take them away from the deep water environment, the water gets a lot warmer, dissolved oxygen gets a lot lower, so they, they you know, um, had very little success keeping these animals in, alive in captivity. Okay, um, that's, that's the lungfish. Okay, so the lungfish are part of the class Sarcopterygii, um, and that would be the Coelacanthiformes. The Ceratodontiformes are, are what we would describe as lungfish, I guess the lobe, coelacanth and lobe fin fishes, they're all the same group, lobe fin fishes, lungfish are similar to each other. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the ceratodontiformes are referred to as lungfishes because they're the ones that have really functioning lungs. So there, and there's two, two main groups, um, an Australian group of lungfish, and that is in the, they are all in the family, or the, all of the, all of the forms historically are in the family Ceratodontidae. Okay, so another taxonomic hint, IDAE is always family level distinction. So ID, um, on, on the exam you're gonna have a, a quiz and I'm gonna ask you the families and they're all gonna be something ID. Um, that signifies family level taxonomy unless you're talking about plants. Um, because as we all know, plants and Plant biologists are weird, right? Do we all know that? Yeah, okay. Don't tell Dr. Kruger I said that. Okay, so Ceratodontidae is, a, is um, the family, one of the families that is in the Ceratodontiformes, and this represents the Australian lungfish. Um, some of the things that are about them, the characteristics about them include unpaired lung. Um, this is not different, but they have prominently lobed fins, and so on, on this, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the other group don't have this, um, but this is a, a typical Australian lungfish, and this is the, the lobate fins that are characteristic of the group Sarcopterygii, so in that sense, they're, they're pretty classic. Um, and then here's another photograph of that, and so you can see the lobe fins. In this case, he's kind of using it to prop himself up off the bottom. And again, the, you know, the difference between that and a bass fin is that there's muscles and robust bones in there that support that and allow it to move independently uh, of the body wall and elements of it to move independently of the other elements in the fin. So the Australian lungfish is uh, in the family Ceratodontidae. And then the other group um, of uh, Ceratodontiformes is, uh, there's, there's two that are, that are similar to each other. So Lepidosirenidae is a family that includes um, South American, uh, the South American group of, of lungfish. And then Protopteridae is the other Ceratodontiforms that includes the African group. And these guys are, are grouped together. They're each other's closest relative as compared to the Australian group. Um, and so, just think a little bit about you know, why, we, why we think that. I hate this thing. Yeah. That doesn't work at all. Sure it doesn't work. I just don't like it. <clears throat> so these guys are, the, the South American and the African are kind of grouped to, together with each other as opposed to the Australian group because of their evolutionary history. Right, and so if we think about um, the distribution of fishes, you know, let's see if I can kind of replicate this without looking. All right, so if we think about the, the distribution of fishes, one of the, and we talked about this earlier in the semester, one of the things that really strongly affects where species are, 
how they're distributed, how many species are in a particular place is geography and time. All right, so if you combine time with geography, you have to understand we're talking about long periods of time where things are changing, and that applies to this group. So they're all lungfish, but they're more close, these guys are more closely related to each other than the Australians are to them. And the reason why that's true is because when these animals evolved hundreds of millions of years ago, South America, Africa, and Australia were all part of the same landmass. And so lungfishes evolved and spread and diversified. And so we might have said, okay, there's, there's one species of lungfish at this point in history. But their distribution is all across this, right? And so if we follow as these land masses move, the first land mass to break away would be what? Australia, right? So now Australia is out there all by itself. So here's Australia with some lungfish on it. And then these guys remain together for another million years with this happening, right? And so as this is happening, these guys are doing what? The Australian lungfish are doing what? Changing. They're changing. These guys are also changing, but they're changing how? Starts with a T. Together. They're changing together because there's gene mixing there, so the populations aren't differentiating themselves. And then later, these guys separate, and so now you've got the, the African group and the South American group. They're different from each other, but they're more similar to each other than either one of them are to this group. And so that's why we have them in different orders. Um, and so it sounds kind of odd that the South American species would be in the same order with the African species because they're currently those two places are very distant from each other. But if we think about it in, in the you know the context of how land masses move and what's happening evolutionarily speaking, that makes a lot of sense. And that's not the only reason, of course. We've got a lot of modern techniques these days that allow us to um, put these animals together. So some of the things that are true about them is they have paired lungs, which is again. Uh, homologous to the lungs of tetrapods, instead of having lobate fins, they have greatly reduced fins. And so their fins are not just supported by filaments, but they are themselves are really long, kind of spindly looking fins. Uh, but inside, they've got really thin bones that are similar to the lobe fins. They've just been greatly reduced, right? And so, and that likely corresponds to their habits. So these animals live in places that are really thick vegetation. Um, they also burrow quite readily. And so having, you know, fins on, under those conditions is not effective. And they move through the you know, vegetation sinuous like that, as opposed to using their fins to move or, or steer. That's what, what I'm, I'm pushing. Okay, um, they also um, have gills that are greatly reduced um, and <coughs> so reduced so much that they have to be supplemented. So these are fishes that use gills, but they can't only use gills. They have to supplement that with oxygen from the air. And in other words, they're using their lungs quite a bit. And so they are obligate air breathers, which means what? as opposed to facultative. They have, to. they have to. They are obligated to use their lungs. So they're obligate air breathers. If you hold them underwater, they will die because they can't get enough oxygen with their, with their gills at some point in their cycle. Um, and, and the reason why that's true again is because they live in relatively shallow, thickly vegetated, kind of low dissolved oxygen. Um, I don't know why that happened, but low dissolved oxygen, and so they, they can't get enough oxygen using their gills to do that. Okay, uh, let's see what else. Um, and so another thing about these guys that's different than as compared to um, the other groups that I've talked about so far is that they live in ponds and, and habitat that dries up, is prone to drying, and so that the term that we use for that is ephemeral, which means temporary, right? So they live in aquatic habitat that sometimes dries up com completely. Um, and so 
as a consequence of that, they have to go through a process that's called estivation, which is essentially a dormant state during dry periods. Okay, so it's similar to hibernation, except it happens when conditions get very dry and there's some physiological differences, but the outcome is essentially the same. Um, and so they, they, the main thing that happens during this process is their metabolism slows. And if their metabolism slows, then that means the demand for O2 is greatly reduced. The oxygen that they do need comes from the lungs. Right? So these animals are exclusively breathing through their lungs during times of estivation. There is no water, right? so they can't get oxygen using, lung, or using gills. Okay, so really, uh, you know, an, un an unusual group of fishes, and of course, they obviously share a lot of characteristics with our um, the, the tetrapods and the first uh, terrestrial vertebrates. I've got a video here. I don't think we have enough time to, to do the whole thing. I'm just going to see if it'll play, and then I'll show it to you next time. Want to? I don't. I'm good. Just hit start without your data. Oh, start without. Okay. Don't allow. Don't allow that. Don't want that to Confirm happen. and continue. Confirm and start browsing. Just browse YouTube. Yep. Browse it. There's one simple hearing hack. How much time do I have? Two minutes. You want to watch it or not? Yeah. Okay. Anyone yeah, can do this to improve their okay. hearing almost overnight. Let's go on. Southern Africa is home to a very primitive fish with some extraordinary abilities. It's the lungfish, and while it has gills like any other fish, it can also <coughs> breathe air directly using a modified swim bladder that acts as a lung. When water levels are high, this isn't so important, but the rains will eventually fail, and the constant burning sun will dry up all the water. Fish are left flapping at the surface as the waters disappear. Only the air gulping lungfish is able to cope with these extreme conditions, but it's still exposed to the heat and it's still at risk from predators, so it relies on another, even more extraordinary ability. It finds a new, safer home buried underground. Digging down by eating mud and pushing it out through its gills. To stop it drying out, the lungfish exudes a special mucus from its skin, covering itself in a thick layer that hardens to form a waterproof cocoon. Only a single hole is left for breathing. Baked into this mud sarcophagus, the lungfish slows its metabolism to 1 60th of its original rate, relying on its muscles and body fat as a source of food and water. It becomes just another piece of hardened mud and lungfish have even been known to end up as an accidental brick in a mud hut wall. But this isn't the end for the lungfish. It can survive like this for an incredible four years. Eventually, it could end up poisoned by its own waste products. But in this case, the onset of the rains is its salvation. As the mud walls are washed away, the lungfish's hard mucus lining is softened. It's been four years since it last used its muscles, and they're very weak. But as it breaks free of this mud cocoon, it still manages to drag itself towards the nearest source of water. It's the ultimate survivor. And although it's underwater now, it'll soon be back in the mud, repeating the whole process again and again as the annual rains come and go. Oh, sorry, how about Lunch